Okay. Welcome to your city council meeting of Tuesday, November 15th, 6 p.m. here in our city council chambers. We'll call the meeting to order. Please rise with me as we have Councilmember Stern lead us in the Pledge of the Flag. Your right hand over your heart, we will begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilmember Franklin? Here. Councilmember Hadley? Here. Councilmember Stern? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery? I am here. Mayor Napolitano? I am here as well, and Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery is joining us by Zoom tonight. He's not feeling well, and we appreciate him sparing us the. Uh, Contagion. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, no ceremonial calendar tonight, so we're on to approval of agenda and a waiver of full reading of ordinances. Any uh, items want to be removed from the consent calendar? So now we have a motion by Councilmember Hadley, seconded by Councilmember Stern. Uh, uh, if I may, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, item number seven, I'd like to pull that. Okay, we'll pull item number seven then. They'll be pulled under consent calendar when we consider okay. that. But that's just a, the heads up that oh, we'll be Oh, approval. Out. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, it works. We, we need to know now, so thank you okay. for that. Okay, so with the exception of item 7, it's the approval of agenda and waiver full reading. I saw the uh, motion by Councilmember Hadley, second by Councilmember Stern. I have to do a voice vote. We're ready to vote. Oh, mm -hmm. we're going to do a voice because of Councilmember or uh, Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery. Okay. Councilmember Stern? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery? Yes. Councilmember Hadley? Yes. Mayor Napolitano? Yes. Councilmember Franklin? Yes. All right, that takes us to community announcements of upcoming events. Is there one minute announcements of upcoming events in the city? Come on down if you have an event you want to share with everybody. Uh, hi, good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. My name is Josh Murray, and I'm here on behalf of Manhattan Beach Library. I'd like to invite the teens of the community to learn how to make a woven bookmark this Thursday, tomorrow, November 16th at 4 p.m. Learn basic weaving techniques as you create your own bookmark. Explore how different cultures around the world use unique weaving styles and patterns to represent their identity and history. And attendance is limited, so advanced registration is required, or strongly encouraged at least, and it's now open in, on our website, LACountyLibrary.org. And I'd also like to invite the community to the Friends of the Library's quarterly book sale this upcoming Saturday, November 19th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the library's community room. And most books are a dollar and proceeds are used to fund library programs. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. All right. Are there community announcements? Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Sedisrich. I'm the new um, executive coordinator for the North Manhattan Beach uh, Business Improvement District. And we are putting on the annual holiday stroll. So just want to let everybody know that. It's December 1st from 5 to 9 p.m. We're going to have Santa, Petting Zoo, Ugly Christmas Sweater, sweater Ugly Christmas Sweater Contest, a surfboard decorating contest, pop-up stores, a roping musician, and much more. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So I just want everybody to know about that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. I'm Archie Sermon with the Parks and Rec Department, and we have some slides up here. Going to go over a few upcoming events. First off, tomorrow night, I'd like to invite you and members of the community to kick off the holiday season by attending the Pier Lighting and Holiday Open House tomorrow evening between 5 and 9 p.m. Of course, don't miss the most magical part of the evening when our very own mayor will flip the switch to light up the pier at 7 p.m. Also, we have... Um, our winter, upcoming winter registration will start on December 5th. We offer several classes to help choose from, or you could choose from several classes to help you accomplish your New Year's resolution, so be sure to register early. And a reminder that we have added six new pickleball courts at the middle school with current open play hours on weekends from 8 a.m. to dusk. We're also proud to announce that we will be utilizing these courts along with Manhattan Heights on November 26th and 22nd for our second annual Thanksgiving Pickleball Tournament. Hmm. Yeah, hope to see you there. 
And finally, for those of you interested in receiving a flu, COVID-19, or COVID-19 booster shot, LA County Department of Health will be offering free shots tomorrow at Jocelyn Center from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So thank you. Mm. I'll do that. All right, thank you. Do you have to sign up for that? Jocelyn Center. Oh, Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. Do you have to sign up for the flu shots? No. Just show up for the shots? All right. Thank you. They change the needles, right? <laughs> All right. Only if, you, only if you're nice. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. As you are aware, the City is part of a Community Choice Energy Provider, Clean Power Alliance, otherwise known as CPA. Um, and CPA generates clean energy, which is distributed over the Southern California Edison infrastructure. This isn't a physical event I'm announcing, however. Um, coming January 2023, we are excited to announce um, that CPA's rates are anticipated to be 2% lower than this year. Um, and that is, uh, that is due in, in large part to the increasing amount of renewable energy, um, and that, which is lowering the cost of energy generation. Um, furthermore, as compared to customers who remained with the Southern California Edison rates, CPA's customers are anticipated to have bills that will be between 9% and 13% lower. Um, and so as the council may recall, initially there was going to be a premium on renewable energy. However, it's uh, shaping up that it's a lower cost, and that's something to look forward to in the new year. Thank you. All right, thank you. Early presence. Other community announcements? Chief. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Rachel Johnson, your police chief. I just wanted to take a moment to speak with the Council and the community about our upcoming holiday season and the things that the police department is doing in support of, you know, enhanced patrols during the holiday season. I'll start with tomorrow's peer lighting. You know, a wonderful event for our community. My first peer lighting. I'm looking forward to it um, very much. For our peer lighting, we have our normal special, special event staffing with our personnel, but we also have two quick reaction SWAT teams that will be in the city available should there be any sort of critical incident or event that occurs during the peer lighting to help us with crowd management and any incidents as they occur. Our next special event after that is our fireworks show. Something else I'm looking forward to as well, fireworks. Don't ever get old. You know, when you're a little kid till, till now, I love fireworks. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. We bring, that brings a lot of people to our city. And for that event, in addition to our normal special event staffing, which is increased personnel to manage the event, we will have quick reaction teams from four of our agency partner, partners to help us with any, in, managing any incidents as they occur uh, during the fireworks show. So we're very well prepared for these large events that bring in a lot, a lot of people to our city to enjoy the festivities. On a more routine basis, the holidays bring with them a lot of people. Right now, the wind and the cold weather is keeping everybody home, but as soon as the holiday season starts, we all try to get out our cute sweaters, or at least I do. We meet our <laughs> friends and we go to parties, and we do a lot of shopping. And in support of that, we have our holiday patrols, which is 32 days of extra patrols um, in our city focused on our retail areas and our residential areas um, to ensure that we are providing high visibility patrols and looking out for someone. If you if someone sees a suspicious person, having those officers who are specific, specifically detailed to go and contact those folks. Um, we were very fortunate this fall. Our, our staffing has allowed us to add a swing shift this fall, so that's an overlay shift that uh, works a little bit of day shift, a little bit of night shift. And that swing shift during the holiday season will also be on holiday patrol as well. So we have quite a bit of staffing to help us out through the holidays, uh, in addition to our normal staffing, to ensure that we're, we're visible, we're present, we're able to respond, and that we're ready. In addition to our holiday patrols and all the staffing, we're going to do our, our normal messaging to amplify what we're doing, to see something, say something you know, um, lock it or lose it, all those things that we do during the holiday season to encourage everyone to make sure they secure their parcels, have a friend take in their deliveries, and just overall plan for a safe holiday season. I also wanted to talk with the council and the community a little bit about our strategic plan. We're in the process of developing our strategic plan. Our last two-year plan lasted four years because of the pandemic, but we're developing a new one right now. And part of our plan is to get input from the community. So to that end, we're going to have a community meeting for input on our strategic plan on Wednesday, November 30th in the police department community room from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. If you're not able to make that meeting, you can also email us. This is all in the city's calendar. So if you forget everything I've said, you look on the calendar for November 30th, you can see where our strategic plan will be and how you can email in your comments if you're not able to attend. And that concludes my comments for tonight. Thank you, Chief. Yep. 
All right. Any other community announcements? Right, we'll go to Zoom. I, oh. Oh. No, Do we have any on Zoom? Go to Zoom. Why don't I see that? Who do we have? David Archer. David Archer. Okay, yes, please. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council. David Archer, Manhattan Beach Chamber of Commerce, President and CEO. First, I'd like to thank everybody who came out to our Best of Manhattan in October. That was an awesome event, and there was a lot of dancing, so if you weren't there, you missed it. Um, and then I'd like to invite you to our holiday mixer extravaganza on Wednesday, December 7th at the Open Air Plaza in Manhattan Village from 5.30 to 7.30. We'll have Santa there to uh, take all your uh, Christmas wishes. There'll be uh, appetizers and drinks and a Christmas tree and a good time will be had by all. So thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you, David. Anyone else on Zoom? Okay, Council, any announcements? I do. Okay. Thank you. So I just wanted to remind everyone that it is United versus Hate Week, and Manhattan Beach has um, entered a proclamation that's on our consent calendar today, and, I, and we've had some fabulous community activities already on Sunday. Thank you, Mayor, for hosting or emceeing our um, community event at Pollywog Park. It was well attended. I, there were hundreds of people there. Um, I really appreciate the support from our city, from City Manager Mo, from um, Jessica Vincent, um, from Ali Latranja. It was a wonderful event and um, with some fabulous activities. So it was really nice to see our community together. I would encourage everybody to, to get a um, MB stands united against hate lawn sign or a window sign to display on your lawn or in your business window. Um, we were, we will continue to be distributing those for, um, during the winter. Um, tonight, unfortunately, for those of us that are at this meeting, we can't attend the free screening of the documentary Race to be Human, which is over at Miracosta. Um, but we also have on Friday, I want to just remind everybody, to take the moment of silent reflection at 931. We'll be doing that community-wide. Just think about how to be better for our community and how to stand up for each other. So thank you. All right, thank you. Any other community announcements, Council? All right. That takes us to public comments. And these are three minutes per person. These are where speakers can provide comments on any matter that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council, including items on the agenda. Anyone want to come down? Public participation for three minutes? Come on down. Mayor and members of council, Frank Kiela. I'm here to talk on. Frank, just, just like, sorry, what's that sound? Does it sound like someone's Slurpee? No, it's, <laughs> it's for the mics. The mic. All right. The mic. Okay. All right. Are we good? Thanks, Frank. Yes. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. I'm here to speak on item number seven with the fire department. Uh, to me, it's a little bit of uh, back to the future. Uh, when I retired, I was working under the non-represented uh, agreement with the city. And then after I left, I guess they formed a bargaining group and now we're going back to an unrepresented group. Um, I just want to make sure that I couldn't really find the facts of if we did a salary and survey compensation with other division chiefs in the area and, and what they were making. And also was wondering what the percentage of the total compensation difference is between the Firefighters Association and the division chiefs. Um, I wanted to make sure that when we're moving forward in this direction that we have a clear path that's open for promotions from within the department. And I know there was some salary increases, but trying to look at, at the two, it was kind of apples and oranges. So I'm wondering if possibly you can do that comparison and share it with the public. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I wanted to give you a quick update I've been doing over my solar project that failed. Because uh, they said that there was a wind ordinance in the state of California that 
you had to have panels spaced in a specific way. So I called several state organizations, uh, State Building and Standards uh, Committee, uh, Commission, Department of Housing and Community Development, State Fire Marshal, uh, the Division of uh, State Architecture. None of them have heard of that ordinance for, for wind. They said there's no ordinance whatsoever. They said all solar manufacturers should follow local zoning. So these guys were way off, and one person suggested they didn't do it because they didn't want to honor their price. So needless to say, I won't be buying any Tesla or anything soon. So, but I just wanted to give you an update that there was nothing anywhere in the state of California where anyone knew anything about it. And all of our guys were, like, right on on what they knew. Okay. So thank right. you. We'll take a look. Thanks. Is that a volume thing? What is that? It's just going to keep happening. Can we turn down the volume of that? Does that affect anything else? Can we unplug it? Can we unplug it? Is it necessary? The mics are not going to work after that. Hey, okay. That's annoying. Good evening, Council. Um, Kim. Peter Kim, speaking on behalf of North Manhattan Beach. Um, I wanted to speak about uh, item number 14, about the addition of parking. Um, North Manhattan Beach, you guys all know we need more parking. Um, I was looking at some st st uh, statistics and I spoke to a couple of landlords. I don't know if you guys are aware, but uh, north of the fish bar, 99% of the um, businesses are empty. And the main reason why those businesses are empty is because nobody wants to come in when there's no parking. So I think number, uh, item number 14 is very important. I encourage council to have staff take a look at, as well as the planning commission, to take a serious look at creating additional parking to uh, North Manhattan Beach, because it would help the businesses as well as the residents. I think with this addition, we're looking at adding about 76 new spaces uh, in lot four, which would really, really help um, the businesses and obviously attract more businesses, which means more revenue to the city, more taxes, etc. Okay. Secondly, um, we are right now, next month on, on December 6th, we are hoping to bring you um, the sculpture approval for the, the uh, surf, surfboard sculpture uh, to the council. Right now, uh, staff and myself and the artists, we've been working really hard the last two years to bring this to council. Uh, it's right now in legal, um, and I'm hoping that legal can clear this up ASAP so we can get it to council, considering the, all of your names are gonna be on the plaque. Um, on the surfboard sculpture, uh, it would be great if legal can hurry up <laughs> and uh, get us the paperwork, proper paperwork, so we can bring it to council as soon as possible. So we can have this come up at the meeting on the 6th of December. And lastly, come to this holiday stroll, as Danitza said, uh, looking forward to seeing you. Right, Richard? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. All right. <laughs> What's up, Terry? Good evening, council. My name is Mike Davis. I'm an electrical and general contractor. And I live in El Porto and myself, Carlson Construction and Bear Electric. I'm sorry, you're a what? I'm a general and electrical contractor. Electrical? Can you fix this? <laughs> <laughs> That's electronic. All right. Thought um, I'd try. Myself, Carlson uh, Construction and Bear Electric have probably done three quarters of all the undergrounding. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to reconsider uh, consent item nine, where we're finally cashing out hotline for the conduit that they're, they're doing in support of the old frontier uh, system where um, the, we took over the responsibility for completing the underground conduit for the city took over it for uh, Frontier. I have many concerns as well as the other contractors with the quality of hotlines work. We've had numerous issues with uh, broken conduit, conduit missing, uh, conduit not coming to the property line as it was contracted for the homeowners supposed to be on the numbered streets seven feet from the curb to the home line most of the time it was just at the curb which means the homeowners had to pay for something twice because they've already paid for it once with the assessment 
I'm, I'm just concerned that um, the conduit is going to be there and it's going to be fully operational when it comes time to pull the phone lines through because we have no, we have no real verification in a lot of instances. The conduit's there, but we have no idea if it actually goes to the vault uh, because there's supposed to be a pull rope that indicates that, it is, that it's going there and it's, and it's missing. So I think it would be prudent if instead of cashing them out of the last amount of money, at least holding it uh, until we go from overhead to underground conversion and we actually are able to verify that the conduit that they've put in is available and, and it can be used by the homeowner in order to get the, uh, the telephone lines to their property. We have a similar concerns with uh, the electrical and we're, we're yet to see if all that's gonna go correct, but we have had, I've had lots of problems uh, with Hotline and I, uh, I have not a lot of faith that all the conduit is going to be actually useful for, uh, for the electrical. So I want to, I just, I think it would be prudent if we, at, at least at this stage of the game, maybe hold back the money as far as, as the frontier is. Okay. And later we can see what happens with the other, with the other conduit. Okay. Thank you. I Thank sent you an email, but I'm not sure if it went through listing some of the bullet points, so. Okay, up. sorry, thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else here in the audience for public participation? All right, seeing none, Zoom. Who do we have on Zoom? What, nobody? Okay. That takes us out of uh, public participation then, but I'll ask the city manager right now regarding nine, is that even a possibility? Have we verified the conduit and the work there? Well, I'd like Eric Lee to address that, but typically our public works inspectors would be looking at that to make sure everything is, is copacetic before we make final payment uh, to the contract. So even if this is approved, they might not be paid until that's verified? No, I mean, I, I think that before it comes to oh, you, yes. it's, it's inspected. Okay. So the, the work has been completed to city satisfaction. Um, I understand there are some issues. Um, our senior civil engineer managing the project, Jeff Fialka, is here and can get in more of the details. Um, perhaps council pulls this item from consent and we talk about it then. Um, or, or we can delay for another meeting. Well, let me ask our city attorney, do we need to go back then reconsider the um, uh, approval of agenda then? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. it would be a motion to reconsider approval of the agenda. So, uh, council, I would make that motion to um, reconsider the approval of the agenda. No second. No second. Okay. We have a, the Darth Vader second. Of the, okay. So, uh, <laughs> so the second motion then would be to um, pull that item number. Oh, any any objection to the the uh, reconsideration? Okay. Seeing none, then we'll make a motion to pull the item for individual nine. consideration. For individual consideration, is there a second on that? I'll second that. Second. Okay. Councilmember Stern seconds it. Any objection? No. Okay. We'll do that. All right, so that takes us to our consent calendar, and these are routine items. These are items 1, and 11, one through 11, uh, except, uh, with the exception of items uh, 7 and 9, which have now been pulled. I see a motion by Councilmember Hadley to approve the consent calendar with the exceptions of 7 and 9, second by Councilmember Stern. Any other comments on the consent calendar? Seeing none, we'll have a vote, please. Mayor Napolitano? Yes. Councilmember Franklin? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery? Yes. Councilmember Stern? Yes. Councilmember Hadley? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Okay, so that takes us to items removed from the consent calendar. We'll start with item 7, which was pulled by Councilmember Franklin, and this is the consideration of a resolution approving amendments to the compensation plan for full time unrepresented employees to add the division chief uh, to the uh, fire department ranks. Yes, thank frankly. you. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you, Mayor. Um, so I was just wondering if we could get some clarification on uh, what these changes are. I, you know, we, we just went through an election, and there was a lot of information floating around. So we'd like to just confirm, with regards to uh, the imposition of the of the contract, and it, it, it appears that uh, this has so something to do with that, and there are some other changes. So could we get a review of that? Let's let's clarify. It's not the imp imposed contract. This is for the um, battalion chiefs, right? Who have now disbanded as a um, correct uh, as a uh, bargaining unit. As a result, those benefits are now outlined in in this document. 
But can you speak yeah. to the difference, right? Because the, one of the issues in the um, imposed contract, or, or one of the issues brought about due to the uh, contract negotiations with the Fire Association was concerns regarding the uh, compensation amounts and the compression between captain uh, or captains making more than a battalion chief. Correct. Yeah, so I'll have Lisa Jenkins, our HR director, outline these changes for you, but it corrects some of those issues. Okay. And the chief's here, too. Good evening, City Council. I'm Lisa Jenkins. I'm the Human Resources Director for the City. Um, and as was stated before you for consideration are changes to the compensation plan that relate to the compensation of the division chiefs. Uh, that position is being retitled from b battalion chief. Um, so whether it's an unrepresented or a represented group, council gives the authority for any compensation changes in closed session and then a document outlining those changes comes forward to council in open session for um, uh, the public's information and for formal authorization for those changes. Um, so in this case, we're talking about the division chiefs, formerly battalion chiefs. Um, and one of the um, issues that's been referenced is the differential between a top step captain paramedic and the battalion chief position. And so, um, as outlined in the report, one of the changes that's being made within the comp plan is a salary adjustment, essentially, for the division chiefs. Um, so, previously in 2020, uh, when the Fire Management Association was still an association, um, there was a, a longevity increment of 15% that the employees who were uh, currently here at the time were grandfathered to receive. Um, none of those employees are still here, um, so nobody is re receiving that 15% increment. Um, so as outlined in the staff report, one of the preliminary changes to the position is a 15% salary increase, and then the same salary increase that increases that are provided to the other employees in the city. So that's 3% upon council approval, and then 3% in additional years. Um, it's a, a percent and a half in the last year because that's six months versus one year. Um, and that's uh, one of the most uh, significant changes here with the employees moving to the unrepresented group. Um, so typically when we talk about salary differentials, we're talking about what's called um, pensionable or perisable income. So that means whatever salary and pays are um, considered part of the calculation for an employee's pension when they retire. Um, so when we're comparing between those two ranks, the captain and the battalion chief, um, for captain we're talking about their salary as well as their 6% uh, certification pay, 15% longevity pay, uh, if they're receiving acting pay, and then um, specialty pay. And uh, in comparing that um, pensionable income to the battalion chief or division chief position, with the changes that are being recommended, uh, that would result in a 6.75% differential between the uh, top step fire captain paramedic and the top step battalion chief or now division chief. Um, in addition, they receive or will receive, if this item is approved, um, other benefits that are provided to unrepresented employees. So that includes, um, as stated in the report, um, the eligibility for a performance bonus, and that's discretionary only based on a recommendation from the fire chief and approval of the city manager. Um, a slight difference in the medical insurance contribution, and then a... Um, 2.5% contribution from the city to uh, deferred compensation, which is not perisable or um, pensionable. Um, so those are the most uh, significant changes. And then the other red lines that are part of the compensation plan um, represent the existing benefits that are received by the battalion chiefs currently. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any specific uh, follow-up questions. Councilman Franklin, did you have any? Okay, I, I think that does it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we're basically, though, switching from longevity to straight pay with the additional items that you discussed. We're making a change to salary that's the same as the previous longe uh, longevity increment. 
Thank you. Chief, are we good with this? Uh, yes, Mayor, we are. And just to add to um, one of the gentleman's questions earlier, um, we will be pre conducting an internal promotional exam, internal only, and I do have three candidates that are interested, so it is causing upward movement for the department. So movement from our association to the division chief position. So Good. it's going to help with that. All right. All right. Thank you. Any questions from council? Okay. We'll open up to the public for public comment. Okay. Anyone on Zoom? Okay. Council? Is there a motion? To adopt the resolution, I'll make that motion. Okay. Adopt resolution number 22-0157. Okay, I'll second that. So we have a motion and a second. Councilmember Hadley? Yes. Mayor Prentin Montgomery? Yes. Councilmember Stern? Yes. Mayor Napolitano? Yes. Councilmember Franklin. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. All right, thank you. And that takes us to item number nine, another item pulled from the consent calendar. This is consideration of accepting as complete work performed by a hotline construction regarding un underground utility assessment districts 19-12 and 19-14. Mayor, respectfully, uh, we recommend this item be continued to December 6th, and uh, they'll give us time to consult with the city attorney and have uh, more information from the council at that point. Okay. Any objection? To that council? That's no? great. Okay. Thank we'll you. continue that. All right. That takes us to public hearings. Item number 12. This is conduct public hearing and consider adopting two ordinances to amend Title IX and Chapter 3.16, the Manhattan Beach Municipal Code, to adopt the 2022 California Building Standards Code by reference. This includes the building code, residential code, fire code, electrical code, plumbing code, green. All right, you get it. <laughs> good evening. City. We have a motion. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> um, good evening, members of the council. My name is Netta Lyle. I'm a senior plan check engineer here at the city. Um, let me see if I know how to use this. <laughs> um, as you may be aware, we have a three year cycle for our California building standards codes. Um, our California Building Standards Codes um, has 12 codes um, listed above here at the slide. Um, these all go into effect January 1st, 20, 2023. Um, the city is able to make amendments to these codes uh, given that they can meet these following conditions of climatic, geological, and topographical conditions. The state has made some changes from the last code cycle three years ago. Some of the notable changes are established requirements for electric ready homes. Um, they've expanded the requirements of solar PV systems and battery storages. <clears throat> they've also updated, they've made updates to electric vehicle charging station requirements in the green building standards codes. The majority of our local amendments that we have made changes to are either continuations from our last code cycle or we've clarified certain things from our, in certain sections. So we've continued to limit the maximum duration of permits for construction projects. Um, we, one of the big changes is that we made clarifications for when fire sprinklers are required. Um, we've aligned our building and our fire codes to match. Um, we've continued to prohibit the use of wood shakes and wood shingles for new and re-roofs. Um, continue the requirements for undergrounding or stubbing out for utilities. Um, remove the local amendment to disallow aluminum conductors. It's allowed with third-party testing. Um, we've allow, we also allow non-corrosive plastic building materials in residential constructions due to our environmental conditions. We've aligned the requirements of sustainable building measures with the current green building standards. Um, we've clarified and updated the city's current construction rules. And we've updated and clarified the requirements of solar photovoltaic systems. Uh, the majority of our local amendment changes are structural, um, given that we're in California and we have earthquakes. We have combined with, with our joint effort of 89 jurisdictions in LA County, and we've made structural changes to the code. And that's something that we've been doing for many years. Uh, we've also done public outreach. We um, sent an email out to a community development uh, depart, depart, department's email list 
Um, I've had copies of the ordinance resolution and the codes available at the city clerk and at our, at our front counter for at least 15 days. Um, and we've also put in um, a notice to the beach reporter in, on October 27th and November 3rd. So lastly, staff recommends that um, the city council adopts ordinance numbers 22-008 and 22-0009 and resolution number 22-0143 and 22-0145. <laughs> Thank you guys, and, and I have any questions I can answer for you. Okay, I can't resist. There <laughs> might be some others, but what is this wind ordinance that Mr. Joseph was talking about? What ordinance? The wind ordinance. It probably has nothing to do with these adoptions so, but I'm not sure exactly but I was going to follow both of them after okay this so you'll follow up later okay yes. thanks okay so any questions though on these amendments to the ordinance from council all right seeing none we'll open up to public participation then anyone from the public want to come down and speak to this item I'm sorry, I arrived a little bit late. Stefan Kappa, just a, a citizen here. Uh, did you read the e-comments already? Um, I'm yes. sure you did. So one of the key things that uh, I have a concern about is making sure that we have the people informed that need to know this, the architects, the GCs, the trades. One of the key complaints we've heard about the city is that it takes a long time for permits to get processed. And that issue happens when we submit, and then there's corrections. It goes back, and it goes back and forth a lot. So if we have a new set of codes coming in, the more we make the architects aware, the GCs aware, the better they're going to submit that. So what are we going to do to make sure that we let those people know what these changes are so we can make our process as efficient as possible? That's one of my key concerns there. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there speakers on this item? Okay, anyone on Zoom for this item? No, All right, seeing none. Uh, Ryan, do we have an answer to our outreach on that? Sure, absolutely. So we've already started our outre outreach, as, as Netta suggested. We've, we've posted in the Easy Reader, and we've emailed um, the construction community email list that we have. Um, we've also put in our quarterly newsletter. And then we will be doing a meeting with the contractors probably just after the start of the year. Uh, keep in mind that contractors don't typically see this change for up to six months after the code cycle, because you know the the codes don't go into effect until projects are submitted for review, um, until after January first. So they go through plan check and then get pushed out to the contractors after the approval. So we usually wait until a month or two after the new year to to start introducing the contractors to the changes. Um, our inspectors also on a daily daily basis um, will will educate contractors as they see them out in the field. Um, there's also training seminars. Currently, we're working with. Um, energy is one of the large changes. We're, tr we're currently work working with Bruce Cheney, who um, just completed a seminar in Redondo Beach. We're, we've hosted him here in Manhattan Beach in previous code cycles, and we're working on having him host a, s a seminar here as well. And do we have any list of architects that we send to as well? So we do. That's the email list that as we part have. part of the construction? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Any questions on that, Council? All right. Thank you. All right. Council discussion or motion? Um, I'd like to yep. j j just ask another question, if I may. So um, in, uh, in reading through this, it sounds like the state is requiring a couple of things. Number one is um, electrification ready within any significant remodel or new construction. So even if you have gas appliances in there, you still have to make accommodations for for um, electrical appliances? That is yeah. correct. Okay. So there's sort of dual kind of. Yeah, the state has been, been pushing for net zero buildings for at least 10 years now. Um, electric, electrification is one of those items. Um, keep in mind, buildings' lifespan is considered to be approximately 50 years, typically. So they want to be ready for any, any changes in the future. So you can install a gas-powered appliance, but you have to have it ready for um, electrification if, if you ever desire to change it. So there is a conscious effort to eliminate natural gas as a energy source so within the state. So cur currently the state requires, with this new code, requires you install the, the electric outlets. Okay. And then uh, also, too, um, 
I forget the expression as far as, um, was it something? There, there's analysis that needs to go through, that needs to be done on the energy efficiency of a proposed building remodeled again. There's a score, essentially. Uh, and then if the uh, home, based on the materials, the windows, the insulation, everything like that, if the home uh, does not meet these qualifications, I believe it's called the Title 24 uh, on the, um, on the uh, mm -hmm. saving side, then the state wants to mitigate that by requiring, or one thing that, that a homeowner can do is put in solar panels and to increase the amount of energy that's generated to bring that score within the acceptable range. Is that Gen fairly generally, accurate? <laughs> generally, generally correct, <laughs> yes. Okay, so really the state would be very happy with every single one of us having solar panels on our home at one time or another, certainly with new construction and, again, major remodels. Yes. Okay, so, okay thank you. So my comment on that is, you know, here we see the state overreach again into local codes uh, for doing something that the state wants. It may be a noble gesture, it may be a noble effort, but um, personally I feel that it's a homeowner's choice. It's a homeowner's investment. It's a homeowner that's going to be paying the bills. Uh, this is pretty much forcing uh, solar panels on a home. Uh, maybe most of us, uh, I believe, uh, any homeowner within Manhattan Beach could go ahead and ask for that information and make a decision about what's best for their family, what's best for their budget, what is best for their longevity, and what's best for the planet, quite frankly. Um, right now, we have the uh, Clean Power Alliance, where we are getting clean energy or energy that's generated uh, by wind and solar uh, that we can go ahead and whether or not that's electron for electron, brought into our home. I still don't quite know how that works, but uh, we are offsetting uh, the carbon emissions and the like. So um, I'm just bringing this up as a matter of point. Uh, we have to pretty much accept what the state uh, gives us, but just to keep an eye on it, uh, contact your assembly person, your state senator, uh, and tell them that you are a uh, reasonable thinking adult that has to make these decisions and you want the decisions to be yours, if that's the way you feel. So, thank you. Okay. Do we have a motion and a second? Motion by Councilmember Stern. Is there a second? Second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mayor, before, uh, um, I would suggest we take the ordinance 22008 and the resolution 220143 first, for the first motion. Sure. I'll so read moved. the title. Ordinance number 22-0008, an ordinance of the City of Manhattan Beach adopting by reference the 2022 editions of the California Building Code, California Residential Code, California Electrical Code, California Plumbing Code, California Mechanical Code, California Existing Building Code, California Green Building Standards Code, California Energy Code, California Administrative Code, California Historical Building Code, and the California Referenced Standards Code, together with certain deletions, additions, and amendments to Titles 5 and 9 of the Manhattan Beach Municipal Code. Okay. We had a motion by Councilmember Stern, second by Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery. Can we vote on that? Councilmember Hadley? Yes. Councilmember Stern? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery? Yes. Councilmember Franklin? Yes. Mayor Napolitano? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. And so, is there a motion to adopt Ordinance 220009 and Resolution 220145? We have a motion by Councilmember Stern. Second, Montgomery. Second by Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery. I'll read the title. Oh. <laughs> Ordinance number 22-0009. 
an ordinance of the city of Manhattan Beach adopting by reference the 2022 edition of the California Fire Code, certain deletions, additions, and amendments to Title III Manhattan Beach Municipal Code. Mayor Napolitano? I need more coffee if you're going to keep reading those things. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery? Yes. Councilmember Stern? Yes. Councilmember Hadley? Yes. Councilmember Franklin? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. And just for the record, and this is a different process than most ordinances, every three years the City Council has to do this. And you have an introduction first, which you did back in October. Mm -hmm. and, and so this was adoption. So this is, you're done. This will be um, available, uh, this will be effective 30 days from today. And as mentioned by the building official, most of the fees don't go into effect until uh, 2023. Okay, so they're quick on this, but we haven't, we haven't certified our housing element yet, I take it. All right, item number 13. Conduct a public hearing regarding the proposed use of community development block grant funds for fiscal year 2022-2023 and 23-24 as required by the Federal Housing and Urban Development Program in consideration of a resolution authorizing the allocation of the CDBG funds. Director Lee. Good evening again. Um, Senior Civil Engineer Tim Berthesell will be doing the presentation tonight. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Tim Berthesell, Senior Civil Engineer with the City. <clears throat> We're here this evening to conduct a public hearing and present on the 2023-2024 Community Development Block Grant Program. Agenda act action items include adoption of the resolution approving the 2023-2024 uh, CDBG program that authorizes the use of CDBG funds totaling approximately $200,000 for the construction of 20 Americans with Disabilities Act's compliant curb ramps. CDBG regulations require that a public hearing be conducted to obtain citizens' views and to provide a public forum for questions regarding the proposed C CDBG program. What is the CDBG program? Uh, the CDBG program's mission is to improve the quality of life of low to moderate incomes persons, aid in the prevention of neighborhood deterioration, and meet other urgent community development needs. CDBG funds are used to improve the mobility and accessibility of disabled persons and senior adults. The proposed scope of work includes construction of approximately 20 ADA curb ramps to improve paths of travel for elder, elderly and disabled residents. Uh, ADA ramps will be constructed in residential areas adjacent to schools and along safe routes to schools. And since 2017, CDBG funds have installed 88 ADA, ADA compliant curb ramps in Manhattan Beach, and that's just CDBG funding. Funding availability for 2023-2024, uh, CDBG annual funding is based on the number of cities participating, census population counts, and poverty, overcrowding, and age of housing stock. The city's, the city's funding estimate based upon prior year allocations includes $100,000 estimated in CDBG for year 23-24, $105,000 in unspent prior year allocation, so for an overall approximately $200,000 available for 23-24. A summary and recommendation. At the financial year 23-24, CDBG funds totaling approximately $200,000 are available to construct 20 ADA compliant curb ramps. This project is consistent with the city's, CD, uh, city's CIP program. And staff recommends that City Council adopt resolution approving the fiscal year 23-24 Community Development Block Grant Program. And that concludes the presentation. Okay. Any questions? All right. Seeing none, we'll open up to public. Any public comments on this item? Come on down. Me again. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, just a quick question. So we've got 20, 88 uh, ramps, 200,000. Seems like the, the budget and the cost just fit nicely together. How many more ramps do we have in the city of Manhattan Beach, which would be out in the out years that we would have to account for? That we have or we need? 
that we need, right? That we need. <laughs> yeah. Glad to respond to that question. Um, currently, the city has 1,705 existing ADA ramps, and there are 1,263 missing or non-compliant ADA curb ramps throughout the city. So 1,263. Wow. So we keep chipping away. All right. Any other public participation on this? Anyone on Zoom? No, nope, seeing none. All right. Council? Any comments, questions, motions? We have a motion by Councilmember Stern, second by Councilmember Hadley. Motion That's for to approve? To adopt resolution twenty two dash zero one five five. Okay. City Attorney, anything further to read on that? Okay. Nope. We have a motion and a second. Roll Co call. Councilmember Stern? Yes. Councilmember Hadley? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery? Yes. Mayor Napolitano? Yes. Councilmember Franklin? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right, that takes us to item K general business. Discuss the expansion. As item number 14, discuss the expansion of public parking structure lot 4 located at the northeast corner of Rose Cairns Avenue and Highland Avenue. Director Lee. Public Works is pleased to pre present this item to you tonight. Uh, Senior Civil Engineer Jeff Fialco will be doing the presentation. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Jeff Fialco, Senior Civil Engineer. Okay, so the existing structure for parking structure lot four situated at the northeast corner of Rosecrans and Highland Avenue was constructed in 1980. It's two levels. The existing topography on the east side of the structure is about 12 feet higher than the grade at the west side of the structure, which allows the lower level to be accessed directly from Highland Avenue. And there's 38 spaces on the lower level. The upper level can be accessed directly from 38th Street, and there are 39 spaces on the upper level there's no ramp currently between the two levels. If the city were to construct a new structure at the site, the local coastal program dictates that the allowable height of a new structure at this location is 30 feet. And in cases of sloping topography as this is, that height of 30 feet is established by averaging the four property corners and then determining a height 30 feet above the average elevation of all property corners. And there's one additional stipulation on that, which is that the total height from the lowest adjacent grade cannot exceed that 30 feet by more than 20%. So what it boils down to at this site is a 36 foot maximum allowable height above the Rose Grand, sorry, above Highland grade. So what we've shown here is the red line at the top is the maximum allowable height, again, approximately 36 feet above Highland. Um, all of these numbers are estimates because we don't have a site-specific survey. We're just trying to give a, a pretty good idea. You know, these are probably within a couple feet of what the actual grades are around the structure. So with a, that allowable height, we anticipate that we could have three levels above the Highland Avenue street grade, which would be one additional level above the existing what we call maybe level two of the structure that's there right now. And we're proposing that a new structure feasibly could contain two additional levels below grade, so below the Highland Avenue street grade. So the estimated cost to construct a five-level structure at this site is on the order of $9.5 million. That would contain approximately 140 stalls. Um, that's in addition, that's an increase of approximately 63 stalls over the 77 that are currently there. And the reason that we don't get as many spaces per level as we currently have is because once we incorporate ramps, elevator, and we also have the uh, ventilation we'd have to provide to the lower levels, we don't get as many stalls per level. With that, I'll open it up for discussion. Okay, any questions right now? I'm going to uh, say right now that um, perhaps uh, we need to have a closed session on this item in the near future. 
put off any discussion of this and receive and file for the moment. Yes, there's oh, that's fine. Any there's opposition to that? A session with any objection, concerns? Okay. We'll open it to per public participation, though, if anyone wants to speak to this. We heard from Peter Kim earlier. You want to come down and speak to this item? you got to sit closer. I will next time. Actually, I need the exercise. There you go. So, you know, um, I did put this in my e-comments. Um, one of the things I'd like to see is the business need clearly stated. Okay, because we, everybody says we need parking, but how much and who for is what I'm interested in knowing. You know, you get what you measure, so we should define, okay, we're short X number of parking spots in, you know, North Manhattan for what purpose? Is this going to achieve our goals or not? Because that's what we want to measure, and when we're done with this, what the business value is at the end of the day. I'd like to see that in the presentation and the discussion. Secondly, when you do the math for those additional parking uh, spots, it comes out to about $150,000 per spot, okay? Um, and so the question then is, where do we get the return on that, okay? And how long is that return of an investment going to come? If we're going to yeah, have parking meters or whatever like that, let's just understand what that is and understand how long it's going to take for the city to get that return on investment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and maybe, uh, Bruce, you can speak to the past, how we've had vehicle parking districts. Sure, and the north end is a prime example, but that parking, because the parking structure was built by assessing the businesses uh, for that facility that was, that was uh, constructed. And so that's a financing option that's available to us as well going forward. I think that was paid off you know, over a period of 30 years. It was, yeah, it was 30 years. Yeah. Again, we're talking about businesses that don't exist um, beyond, well, basically in El Porto. We have at basically empty lots, empty businesses, empty buildings north of, um, north of Fish Bar. On the north end, or there would be the on the both on the east and the west side. So you're talking about businesses, um, and speak to Mr. Company's um, um, question. We're probably talking about 15 to 20 more businesses that could come in if we have this parking. Realistically, um, I know that a couple of the developers that were developing the um, the nail salon, the old market there. Um, They've hesitated to go on and build a mixed-use property there because of the parking issues. And I know that on the uh, east side, um, they've also hesitated on building a bigger space for retail as well as residential. So I think a parking space, expansion of a parking space, addresses a couple things. Parking for residents as well as businesses. And... You know, therein, that's where the revenue would come in. So, again, and I, I do advocate you going to a closed session to discuss this. Thank so. you. Okay, without objection, though, we'll, we'll carry it over mm -hmm. and set a future uh, meeting date for that. All right, so that takes us then to um, item L, City Council requests and reports, including AB 1234 reports. First of all, does anyone have any 1234 reports? No. Okay. I automatically look to you, Richard, for that. So um, that takes us to item 15, which is a request by Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery and Councilmember Franklin to consider placing cameras at public facilities and public areas or parks. Uh, and this needs a third uh, council member. I'm happy to be that third. All right. Is that all we need tonight? We all we need is the third tonight. Okay. So that'll be come back at a future agenda. So. That has three votes. Uh, next one is item 16, request by myself and Mayor Pro Tim Montgomery to consider renaming a baseball field in recognition of former Mayor Walt Dewar. And that needs a uh, third um, uh, vote as well. I'd be honored to do that. Thank you, Councilor. Okay, so that's three for that. So they'll come back at a future uh, agenda. Uh, future agenda items. Anybody have future agenda items? Okay, seeing none. Uh, city manager report. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as really? we all know, the holidays. I'm sorry. Really? You're killing my whole timeline here. 
All right. You want me to talk slower? Is that what you're telling no. me? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. As we all know, the holidays are coming, and uh, you have a council meeting scheduled for January 3rd. Uh, and uh, typically that would require that staff work over the holidays to prepare the agenda and have it ready for that meeting. Uh, so uh, I'd like the council to consider uh, perhaps canceling that meeting uh, and then looking to perhaps add a meeting on December 13th uh, so that we could accommodate the council items that would have appeared in January and in December, uh, have those appear on the December 20th and perhaps a December 13th meeting uh, which could also serve to uh, be the swearing-in date for the new council uh, because we should have election results by then. So I'm suggesting that council consider canceling January 3rd, uh, keeping the 20th, and then adding December 13th for a, a lighter meeting to seat the new council, maybe have a, f a few agenda items on there. Okay. Uh, council, our thoughts on this? I'm good with it. Yep. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Montgomery's good. I'm good. All right, you're I'm, good. I'm, I'm good. good. All right, everyone's good? I'm good. Everyone's good. Perfect. Thank you. No other report. Thank you. City Attorney report. How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Five hours. Okay. <laughs> nothing, to re nothing to report. Nothing to report. Okay, we do have some informational items. Item 17, the agenda forecast 18, is a quasi-judicial decision that would need to be uh, appealed now, right, if that were, or within the 15 days? Yeah, this was as an opportunity for two council members to call this up for review. Okay, so. It's not their only opportunity, but this is right. perhaps the first opportunity. That's a schedule, okay. Anyone on that? All right, seeing none, we didn't have a closed session. Uh, so we'll move to adjournment, and um, my understanding is that uh, Councilmember Franklin has a adjournment for us. So if you'll rise, Mr. Franklin will share the adjournment. Thank you, Mayor Napolitano. Um, you know, at times you meet uh, a person and admire them not for what they have, but who they are. And Manhattan Beach lost such a person recently, John Lapham. I met John when our daughters were in kindergarten about 25 years ago when they started to play Manhattan Beach youth basketball. John was the commissioner, a truly thankless job, where he had to cajole, beg, and plead other dads to volunteer to coach a swarming pack of five- and six-year-olds. Throughout the years, John demonstrated his character when he took pains to ensure that all team drafts were fair. He never allowed stacked teams overloaded with talented kids, especially not his own, and would willingly scoop up less talented players at the end of the draft. John made it fun for his team. Not a laugh out loud kind of fun, but fun knowing if you came to practice, tried hard, and practiced on your own time, that ball would go in the hoop every now and then. John used the universal language of basketball to help at the Al Wooten Junior Youth Center and Ketchum Downtown YMCA serving as tutor, coach, and board member. Over the past decade, he lent his talents and coached the Miracosta Varsity girls basketball team uh, to, and uh, enjoyed uh, several CIF championship competitions. John's coaching and love added to the foundation of life skills for these children, which would help them meet challenges they would face in life with determination, resilience, and teamwork. John had a great sense of humor, mostly self-deprecating, was an avid reader, always made you feel welcome and cared deeply about everyone he knew. John is survived by his wife, Evelyn, son, Thomas, and daughter, Emily, and her husband, Donald. He will be missed by all who knew him and live on in our hearts. At his service yesterday, Emily poignantly shared with us John's four simple but powerful words for a successful giving life. Do good, be good. Thank you. And we'll have a moment of silence for John. We're adjourned. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you.